Just a Good Conversation, podcast number four. Today, my guest is Mark Reitmeyer, a staff photographer at the Orange County Register for over 35 years. You can find him on Instagram as Reitmeyer Mark. His love of photography goes back to his childhood. Mark has a wonderful way of making his photos tell a story, and that is a lost art. His love of nature and the ocean can be found in the paper on a regular basis. Mark's photographs are funny, beautiful, and powerful, and full of life. Simply put, Mark Reitmeyer is a classic photographer. And with that, my dear friend, Mark Reitmeyer. Hey, Matt. Mark, this is going to be great. I am so happy that you have found the time in your busy Orange County schedule (laughs) to sit down and talk what it is to be a photographer in this day and age. Yeah, certainly. Thanks for having me. You are one of the breed of photographers that started early and have now have made this vast change into digital. That's, if I would have told you 30 years ago what it would be like to take a picture, you would have laughed me out of the place. So take me back to growing up as a kid in Ohio where photography was presented to you. I think even started even before Ohio uh, in Michigan, um, East Lansing, Michigan, I got my first camera back in the mid, late 60s. And, but then we moved, my dad was a college professor at Michigan State University, and then we went, moved to Ohio University down in southeastern Ohio. And that's where it kind of got more serious. I took the Saturday morning workshop at Ohio University, it was kind of open to the community where you would shoot photos and then develop your black and white film. And being in the dark room, watching your prints come up on the paper was just kind of magical. And I think that's when I was kind of hooked. And I was in eighth grade, I was like 12 years old. Now, did he give you that camera or how was it presented to you? Like, no, I think the I think I was using my dad's camera and I had a, like a Kodak uh, Instamatic uh, camera I was using. Um, and and that's what I was using for a while until I got my first real camera when I was like, I don't know, 14 or something. I got a, a Nichromat with a 50 millimeter lens. Right. Did the early process of taking pictures and then the back end process of developing, did that come natural to you or is that a bit of a process oh, that to was a, that was a that was a oh that was a pain that was so hard to learn how to make nice nice prints and i ended up doing uh working at the local paper like doing lab work on the weekends helping process film and watching their lab uh lab guy make prints he was a real good printmaker and he taught me how to make prints and yeah, I struggled for years to how to get a good print in the darkroom. What was the, the difficulty? Was it just the combination of like filters and understanding like dodging and burning and time? and Because it was such a magical time to figure out how that worked as a, as a young photographer. Oh, it's just it's trial and error, just constant. It's, it's you know, the, I mean, your enlarger has a lens with f-stops on it and you had to figure out the f what f stop you had to figure out your negative how dense it was or how thin it was and what maybe f stop you'd put the lens at and then you'd have to figure out how how long the enlarger would stay on to to put light onto the paper i mean every it, it was it was really hard to do it's it would probably still be hard to do i mean i haven't done it in years but yeah at what point do you think you got good at it a couple of years in oh no no uh, well, yeah, I think I got proficient at it right. after two or three years. Right. Yeah. Not Hansel yeah. Adam Pritz, but right. you weren't embarrassing yourself. <laughs> right. right, right, right. Yeah, probably at least a couple of years. And uh, But I hated, you know, my hands would break out because I'd put my hands in those trays of chemicals. <laughs> and, and you know, I struggled with that on whether to wear rubber gloves or tongs, or tongs or... In, the, in the trays. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So you don't have that problem with Photoshop. You no, don't have to use no. tongs when you but, use it. No. <laughs> but it's still a it's still a process, oh, though. Yeah. It's still but, people don't understand that you, once you take the photo, it's does it's not an instant photo. That no. there's more behind it. There's you still have to massage it and get it 
to look good. Right. You know? Between your crop, your color, your contrast. Right. right. Yeah. What the newspaper wants in its colors are different yeah, than and what. How, how are you, yeah. And how you're going to uh, tone and, and work on that photo so that it, in the end it will reproduce and look nice in a reproduction, however, right. a magazine or a newspaper. Yeah. So when you were making those prints as a kid, for the newspaper, did they tell you, hey, we prefer a more contrast photo or a less contrast? Because as, right. you, as you, you know. Right, because you get inking or something. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You would, you would have kind of, I think they were more a flatter prints. They wouldn't be like, you know, something you'd put up in a, on a wall or in a museum or right. something like that. So then yeah. there you go. You, you have to know, like, oh, making a print for mom, it's more contrasty. <laughs> right. I'm making right. a print for Harold, the print master, he's going to want it flat. Yeah. His name was, the lab guy, his name was Pudge. <laughs> that <laughs> that already has a description of what kind of lab it was. <laughs> yeah. Was it uh how how was he as an instructor? It was Oh, he was great. Yeah, he was such a nice guy. He had tons of patience and he was glad I was there every Saturday to, you know, help him out. You know, because it was just a laborious, you know, the one or two photographers the paper had, they'd drop off their film from their Friday night games. And it would be in an envelope, and he'd be sitting there spending half his Saturday running film, processing film, and then making prints. And you know, they didn't have so. to do their own film back then. Yeah, they did. Or did they? But, and there was only one, like one staffer, but okay. But he was doing everything. Right. So he would just got to run off to the next thing and drop his film off. Right. You know. Okay. So then you're a kid. You're eighth grade. Where does photography go from there? Are you doing school newspaper, yearbook? Yeah, then in high school, I uh, just immediately got into doing uh, the yearbook and the school newspaper and, you know, taking a class on, in journalism. I don't know if it was my freshman, probably my sophomore year I started in taking high that. In they high had, school? In high school, Wow. Yeah. yeah, we had journalism. Okay. It was like an elective that you okay. can take. So we started. I started doing that. And so, yeah, I was probably one of the main... There was one other guy, but yeah, I was like our school's photographer for the whole time I was there, you know. <laughs> the guy. But I knew everybody. I knew all the people in the band. I knew all the athletes. I knew all the artist type people. I was friends with so many different people. When In high school, you got so many like cliques, you know. You're, sure. You're a member of this group or that group. Right. Or, you know. But you're the hummingbird now right. with the camera. <laughs> I mean, that's what, what yeah. it's like. Yeah, you yeah. Know, you hang out with the jocks for a little bit, right. and you do some drama, and then you exactly. find out. Yeah, so that's yeah. the best part of having that exactly. magical camera. Exactly, and I'm still friends with all those people that were in all those groups. Oh, that's so, special. So, you know, 45 years later, yeah. So what camera and lens are you operating with in high school? Oh, the, I think I got, well, I had, I had my Nicromat. Okay. And I think, yeah, pretty much my Nicromat, the whole thing. I think I got ended up getting another lens. Maybe got an 85 or something. I don't know if I got a telephoto or not. So you got a 15? I must have, got, I must have gotten a telephoto at some point or borrowed one. I, I think a 180-millimeter, uh, the 2.8. Ooh, that's a big boy at the time. Yeah, it was. Because you have a 50 is your other one? Yeah. So yeah. that's your n n wide angle compared to a 180. Right, right. I think I probably had borrowed one. And then I think in college, early college, I ended up buying a used one from a friend. Wow. Did you love that thing? Oh, that was the best lens. Every, people talk about it. I, never I still have mine. Yeah. Do you really? Yeah. Now, why did you keep it and never at some point go, eh, go Man, away? Man, that old Nikon glass was just, God, they were heavy. They were just beautiful. You knew when you had it on your body. Like, yeah. it, it, was, it was there. It was a weight. Right. And it was sharp as a razor. It was just beautiful. Yeah, I still have probably, you know, eight or ten old manual focus Nikon lenses. That's awesome. And probably another five or six bodies, too, like FM2. I think in, in college, I ended up buying the FM2. I never went high the higher end. I know there are a couple higher end right. Nikons, but, I mean, FM2 at the time was, what, maybe 250 bucks or something. And that's a lot of money back then. <laughs> I mean, that was a lot of money to be like, I'm in high school. Can I buy this camera? Right. What right. was minimum wage? <laughs> I mean, good Lord. I think it was a 235 <laughs> Oh, man. <laughs> so... High school, are you the guy in the local newspaper scene? Are you shooting for anybody? Is it just a school thing? Yeah, it was mostly a school. No, there was a guy that was um, the, the 
the local newspaper photographer who was a, a college student who grew up in town, who was a very good photographer, ended up, he was like college photographer of the year. Um, I think he ended up winning POY. Wow. Um, guy was good. He ended up having internships at Louisville Courier Journal, which at the time was a great newspaper. Um, and uh, he uh, interned, I think, one summer at National Geographic. So the guy knew, the guy was good. Yeah, he his was good. Dan, his name is Dan Dry. Okay. And, uh, I've heard of him. And so he took me under his wing when I was in high school, you know, brought me over to the paper. You know, I'd end up going to, fo- you know, college football games, carrying his gear for him, and, right. you know, stuff like that. But, but he'd throw me, you know, some bones occasionally. Hey, can you shoot this assignment? Can you? And it was like, oh, wow, okay. Yeah, yeah. that's great. So what was your process then back then? It was like, right, you're getting this bone thrown at you. Are you trying to, you know, capture unbelievable imagery? Are you nervous? What's your... I mean, you're, oh, just you're trying to make a good exposure, and uh, you know, <laughs> and 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 just get a, a, a decent, halfway decent photo. And the, a lot of the assignments were just you know simple community assignments. Yeah, but for a and, young kid, those are world beaters. Those are unbelievable. Right, right. And and you did want to, you didn't want to come up back with something that was terrible then you know then hear about it and, you know like oh man he'll never give me an assignment again you now know? did you get much feedback from mm-hmm. editors no no okay. you know they'd have it you know pudge would make the print and <laughs> and then just take it out to the city desk and drop it on their desk and that's the you know next you know next time you'd see it in the paper and you know he'd move on is pudge still with us I don't know. I haven't seen, I haven't been back in a long time. I don't know. We've got to find the pudge. <laughs> <laughs> so high school lens, where do we go? Oh, then we went, um, I knew I wanted to, Ohio University was, had probably one of the best photojournalism schools in the country. And, and uh, I wanted to either there or University of Missouri. Okay. But since my dad was a professor at Ohio University, I got to go to school for free. Right. So it was kind of a no-brainer. What was dad doing? What's he teaching? Uh, radio and television. Oh, nice. Okay, so, so you've got a little bit of an inside track then of media, well, media, yeah. media at least, and how yeah. it worked. You right. Your dad wasn't like a civil engineer, and you have right. no clue what right. this camera and, does. And, you know, I, and I had worked uh, at the paper for three, year, three years before I even went to school. Actually, I took a year off after high school. I didn't go right into college. I worked, I worked at the paper full time. Okay. Well, during the day. Travel the world? And then, or, yeah. and that year off? For, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I rebuilt the engine on my car with a friend and uh, worked at the paper during the day and made pizzas at night. Wow. So that was my, that was my year off. That's, that's pretty exciting. <laughs> building engines and flipping pizzas. <laughs> so at what point is the, I guess, hook set in you that you're like, I'm photography and I love it? Because you're, if you're a kid still in high school, you could be like, I still want to be an astronaut. I want to be a football right. player. I want to be a cop. Yeah. Can it be a reality? Right. Yeah. 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 No, I think I, 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 you know, I saw Dan in high school. I saw Dan and what he was doing. You know, he was interning at Geographic and he was moving on. And then he, when he graduated, I think he went to the Courier Journal in Louisville, Louisville. And uh, I knew it was a reality. And I had, known you know i had followed some uh photographers at geographic that uh, work that i liked of theirs and i actually told when he went to intern there i gave him a book i said hey could you get him to autograph this book for me you know because i like this guy's work that's special and uh and so he did so you know i i realized in high school that, that this this could be a reality if i stuck to it you know that's great so yeah yeah it's nice to know what you want to do in, you know, in yeah. high school. You fall in love with it, and you're making pictures, and you're like, oh, this is it. I'm taking the next step. College. And then, and then going to college, going to Ohio University and their visual communications program, we would have geographic photographers come and speak. And, 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 and uh, photo editors from New York Times come and speak and to our classes. Right. And we'd have these big-time people. And they and then they'd, they'd spend the weekend. They'd speak on a Thursday or Friday, and then we'd have a party on Friday night or Saturday night, and you'd get to hang out with these people. And wow. I mean, it was just magical. It was great. You that, know? that is special. Yeah. 
So why did Ohio State... Ohio University. Ohio, sorry, Ohio. Why did they become this place instead of Kentucky or Illinois? How did they get that foundation? I think it was more the, the com- school of communications that it wasn't just the, the photo end of it, but I think across the board, they wanted to be a powerhouse. Okay. And so it was other programs... It, that were shaped were, this thing. Were, they, they had brought in big time people to teach and to so the you know all of their programs were. Did you touch into any other parts of the department, like get into a, a TV or no? Uh, so no. you just strictly that was enough for you to be. Oh yeah. A photo- See yeah. that's great. Yeah, and then the 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 the, the college had its own new, student run newspaper. Okay. Which was really nice. I mean, we had top you know, notch. We had, yeah, we had good photographers, good writers, and it was a daily newspaper, morning daily newspaper. So, How was the circulation? I would think maybe maybe eight eight thousand. That's a or lot, something. though. That's a lot for a little paper like that in the yeah, area that college. feeds the whole. Yeah. Well, the town was you know what five or six thousand, and it had like eighteen twenty thousand students. So. Wow. So yeah, so he kind of competed with the the town newspaper. Did you realize then how special it was, or do you look back at it now and go, "Boy, I had no clue how good it was." No, I, I mean, no, we could do whatever we wanted. It was really special. It was great. Oh, we loved man. it, man. We loved it. You know, it would it would so addicting that you didn't want to go to class. You know, you wanted to go out and shoot right. assignments for the paper. You wanted to do. They just put it in you that like this is it. Damn it! That's we could so do whatever we wanted. That, that's know? great. Now, was that all black and white back then? Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Color was just unheard of. Yeah. Totally. When did you start shooting, or did you ever get that rare piece of film to like I'm going to shoot color for this family trip, or I'm going to? Yeah. I, I mean, our vacations or something. Right. I would, you know, we our family would go on vacation. I'd shoot, I'd shoot color, or uh, or there would be something. That I would decide I'd have some color roll of color. Get through that I mean, black and Dan, white when, roll. <laughs> when when Dan Dry came back from Geographic, he brought me a few bricks of Kodachrome, and so you know I got to shoot Kodachrome. So that was pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dan. <laughs> That's a lot of money. It's a hell of a process for a kid. Yeah. So. Yeah. And you'd send it. You know, it's funny. You'd you'd take it down to the the, the photo store downtown. And who was that? Uh, it was Lamborns okay. in in uptown uh, Athens, Ohio, on Court Street, and and you know they'd they'd fill out the envelope and they'd take your film and put it in and send it away and you'd get it back you know what you know a week ten days later or something. Do you miss that like anticipation of that time? Oh no, yeah, I don't. I thought it was cool that in in, in college when we started processing our own e, like E six uh, mm-hmm. uh, ectochrome and stuff that was. You got to see, you know, with you know, about an hour later, you get to see your 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 slides, you know, instead of waiting for ten days for them. You know. <laughs> Did shooting color was that process a little different for you that you thought about it? Like, okay, blue sky, it's not going to be gray sky. My reds, my greens. Oh man, shooting color was yeah a different ball game. Right. I mean, different. It, I, I you know, when I when I came. When I moved to Southern California and shot all color all the time, man, it was a learning curve. It was years. Wow. It was probably, you know, I hated the first two years shooting color. I was like, God, it was really hard. What, what, explain that. Yeah, uh, yeah what, no, what, cause it's, because it's, it's so interesting to say that. It's like, what pe- you see is what you get. Right. And you can't mess with it. Right. At all. Because today, it's, it's, these kids have no clue how easy it is, <laughs> right? Like, right. for a guy who grew up on black and white, got an occasional treat to shoot some color, now you're thrown into the it's color 24-7. Holy moly. Inside and out. Yeah. Yeah. And you go you, into somebody's dark living room, and all of a sudden you've got to make a nice color photo, and you're like, oh, man. I've got to set up lights and umbrellas, and okay. we got to figure this out. You know? Was that, was that we got to move furniture around <laughs> and take things off the wall? And you know, oh. was that taught at Ohio very well? 
No, no. I think you could take a studio class where you would learn how learn lights, but I was more documentary, black and white, and yeah, we never, we never. Maybe you'd use a flash on camera kind of thing. Was that because of your love for National Geographic that it kind of pushed you to be like that black and white documentary guy? Yeah, that and uh, and I looked at Time Magazine. I thought Time Magazine was great. Right. Seeing that was it. That was the, it. The folks, I think it was David Kennerly and David Burnett and people shooting for Time Magazine were you know somewhere in the world, and they would shoot really cool documentary kind of stuff. Right. So where where did you absorb your media back then as a kid in college? Was it Time? Was it Life? Was it like where were the where were, where were, where'd you go? I mean, it wasn't Barnes and Noble. So where did, where were you hitting your sweet spots to find and absorb your media? Well, it would come. I mean, we'd get Geographic and Time in the mail. Okay. Um, at, you know, we'd we'd get Sunday New York Times every Sunday, and I'd look at that uh, daily newspaper. Um, yeah, I'd go I'd go to the, um, the local bookstore and and look at different magazines that we didn't get. You know, a, a, a Life magazine or. Or, or uh, surfing magazine. I was love looking at surfing magazines. Why is I don't that? know. I don't Why know. It's so different. Okay. It was just you know Southern Ohio, right? There's rolling no. hills of Southern Ohio, and God, somebody's out shooting surfing, making these cool photos. And I'm like, wow, that's really cool. Right. Little did I know that I, <laughs> I move out here and spend 35 years shooting surfing, pro surfer. <laughs> right. You know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but the kid from Ohio right, he becomes a Ohio. surfing photographer. When yeah. did you first see the Pacific Ocean? Oh, I'd seen it. Uh, I had I had visit. I'd, I came out here a couple times and had seen the Pacific Ocean. Okay, but I think when I first it was probably you know my first day or two on the job when I moved here. And All of a sudden, you got blue sky, blue ocean. Or I'm, I'm driving driving to Laguna Beach and. And, you know, it's eight in the morning and then off to my right, it's the Pacific Ocean. And, you know, like, are you kidding me? <laughs> no rolling hills of Athens. It's the ocean. Yeah, that was kind of a trip. Wow. So you work your way through college. Are you, what's your mindset? Are you thinking National Geographic life or are you thinking I'm going to be a newspaper guy? Oh, I thought news, newspaper all the way. Yeah, that, that just seemed back then that was your real... You, yeah, I think the the magazine jobs were few, really few and far between. You had to be be a you know a great fo you know photojournalist, and I think it was easier to get into papers and even to, you know back then there were some really across the country there were some really great newspapers for photographers, mm -hmm. and so if, yeah, and that's maybe what, that would be a stepping stone to a magazine. Yeah, was I, that know, ever I never thought? really thought about a magazine really. Okay. Because then that was the goal, like, or at least yeah, it was I mean, the holy it was, grail. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. But I don't know. I was just happy with. You know, the more I did it, the more I was just happy with the the daily the da daily grind, so to speak, of the newspaper. You know, yeah, something there, different every day. Yeah, there's know. something about that grind. Oh, it is. That it is. is. It's kind of addicting. It's yeah. like, what, what, what am I going to get today? Yeah. What, what are you going to feed me? What are you going to feed me? Am I getting a salad or am I getting steak? Am I a corn dog or I'm getting a tuna sandwich? And that's that's the meal. Are you sending me out to the pageant of the masters or am I doing surfing? Am I doing a or, portrait or? Well, for in Southern California, which is great. And I tell people, you know, working here is not like working in Columbus, Ohio, where I interned for two summers, you know, in college. I, I mean, Southern California, the sports and the news and the, you know, Academy Awards and the yeah. college sports and the pro sports. And I mean, it never stops. Oscars and the, you know, geez, just keeps going. And then you got the beach, you got the mountains, you right? Got the desert. Yeah. It's like wow. Right. What more do you need? <laughs> why leave? <laughs> why why leave? <laughs> so, what is your book looking like now through college? Oh, you know, I've gone back and looked at those, and it's kind of like, oh man, really, really? Oh, you can never judge yourself yeah, though years later like, wow. because. That's what you had back then. Right. That's right, who you were. Right. Right. Late seventies, no, early eighties. You know, I, I think it looked pretty good. Um, yeah, I was I was happy with what I had when I okay. got out of school. Although I, you know, I, I I ended up like I said, I took more photos than books that I read, and I 
and it took me a little longer to get through college than maybe. Uh, but that's fine. But, you know, but you're, you're, but I was going to. I was not paying anything. So <laughs> right, and you're addicted to this craft. <laughs> right, that's true. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's the thing. At least you weren't sitting around taking forty different classes. You were right. addicted to photography, and you were going to feed the beast. But what was ironic was like the last year and a half of school, I hadn't, I never, I didn't pick up a camera. Why? I had to get out of school. Oh, that, all my, okay. All my friends had left. You know, I was like, I can't be here forever. You were becoming Belushi, my seventh year of college, <laughs> wasted down the drain. <laughs> so I hadn't. And then it was ironic. Then I got a call from my, my advisor after I graduated, about a week after I graduated, Chuck Scott, who was a legend in, in the business. And he goes, I got a job for you. He goes, you need to call this guy in Pittsburgh. <laughs> and I said, all right. So, you know, I didn't have to send a portfolio or anything. The really? Guy, the guy just said, you know, because the word of Chuck Scott was. The gold bad, stamp. Bad. Yeah. Yeah. Chuck says. Mark's good. Then Mark's, Mark's good. good. <laughs> that's a great, that's yeah. great to have. Oh, it was great to have. Yeah. What, did, what do you think Chuck saw in you? I think probably determination. Um, I think he was a hard worker. Um, didn't goof off. Okay. Yeah, I so, guess you know. Those shoot, are could pretty damn good, good things, make Mark. Make some good, good makes you know could come through. So who's the guy you call? Well, and I and you know through, all through college I was I was uh, stringing for AP, UP, United Press International, okay. New York Times. Uh, so I was I was doing a decent job for people. You know, and I'm sure he, even though he wouldn't say anything, I'm sure he was seeing that, seeing that stuff. So then who's the guy you call? Who's, who's the, the guy you call who? In. Well, Chuck, you tell, says you, says, call this guy. Who's that guy? Oh, the guy was uh, J. Bruce Bauman. He okay. was in charge of the photo uh, graphics and everything of, of the Pittsburgh press. It okay. Was, Pittsburgh press. And. And so, yeah, I went there, and he was changing the staff. The staff was an older staff that was kind of setting their ways, and he was trying to rile everybody up and make make good good photos and get big photos in the paper. And so he brings in this young blood, and they had some really good photographers there too, you know. Okay. So, and he brought more people in as well. After I was there for a little over a year, and he brought more people in, and and yeah, it was a good place. Is that an internship at the time, or is that mm. a is it a full position? It was kind of a full time temporary position. I think okay. he kind of scrounged some money up, and, right? You know, well, that's great for Chuck to do. I mean, yeah, yeah, it was nice that I don't know, you know, I don't know the back the backstory for that, but yeah, well, it was it was a great year. It was great, you know, it was good for me. So then where are we looking from there? Do you think hey, this is a Landing spot long term, or were you? Oh, that would have been nice. I love Pittsburgh. It's a great city. I love that. Oh, uh, totally man. underrated. I'm sorry, oh, but I think man. Pittsburgh is absolutely underrated. Oh, and if you live in that town, uh, right. the neighborhoods and the restaurants and bars and Especially sports today. and the people there, it just, it's neat. It's right. great. Especially today. It's beautiful the way it's set up. I love that place. Oh, yeah. So are you thinking long term at that point, or what are you thinking? Yeah, you never know. I mean, yeah, I would have liked to have stayed longer, but okay. So what eh, pulls you away you know, from? I think a lot of back then, back in the early mid '80s, the photographers would go to a paper, go to a, a decent paper for two or three, four years, and they'd move on to another one. Right. People were always a lot of hopping, hopping, moving, moving, moving. And, and what, it, that just what people did. It, it was the weirdest thing. Why you know? do you think that was, though? For photographers. Because it didn't happen all in the pe newspaper business. It was photographers. Right, right. And I, I, I don't... I, <laughs> that was a good question. I have no idea why we, why they did that. Cause, uh, but they did. Uh, yeah. Because, I, I mean, you know, as soon as somebody left, they created a job. And uh -huh. it just was like this, you know, domino effect. Right. It was very rare because I would talk with Joe Kennedy at the Times for a photographer to be at a paper for 35 years. Like, right. yeah. you, 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 there was a reason why. It was one or two of a staff of like 30. Two guys might stay. But like you said, somebody was always hopping. Like every senator, like every six years, you just rotate them through or more. I, I don't know why that was with them. I, I have no idea. Was it change the scenery to help? Maybe, you know, maybe keep juices? your yeah. For, maybe that was it. You'd move to a new new town and you'd new scenery. You'd make you'd get excited about 
you know, you, you stay in one place a long time and you're going, you know, you get this every year. Okay, we're going to shoot. Oh, I shot that. I've shot that four times, five times. You right. Know? I've shot that 10 times. You know? Was it also maybe uh, some staff will put money and like, oh, we're, they're getting new gear. I hear they're doing better photos or they're, they're giving us cars or this and that. Like there had to be little incentive carrots. I, that could be too. Because what, new gear what or strip, cars. Right. Or, what strips you away from Pittsburgh? What was it that says, okay, I'm well, leaving? Well, I think the money, that full-time temporary thing was up. Was time, it was time to move, and so I started looking for a job. Okay. So I'm calling. What's that process back then? Yeah. Pre-internet. Call, 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 um, your, call your friends. <laughs> call, you call them. Um, yeah, pre-internet. Right. I mean, I that's I wrote them letters. I mean. Or, no, I think I mostly got people's phone numbers from friends and started calling friends. And Did MPPA have a book back then? Oh, Were you man, even a member? I don't remember. Yeah. Okay. Because yeah. uh-huh. I remember they. I, I remember when I was a kid in the '90s, they had that job book that you once a year come out with everybody's membership name and their number, or their address right. to like. Right. Right. They might may have. I don't know, but you know, through Ohio University, they, we were all pretty connected. We had people all over the country, and so those were most of my uh, contacts that I contacted, um, and a couple people that I had uh, gone to school with. It worked at the register, and so and they they said, "Hey, there's a, there's this job open. We should apply for it." Who were those people that you worked with? Uh, Dan Anderson. Um, he I would I knew him and he, he was we went to school together. Okay. Um, and uh, I think at the time he was a graphics editor, Tom Porter. Um, and so yeah, they said that they said you should apply for this job, and I said okay. You know, sent my stuff out, and then they f- they flew me out. Wow! For like you know, three days, three or four days, or something. Gave you the put, whole. Put me up in a hotel. Did you have to bring a book or have a book or what was your? Yeah, yeah, yeah I brought. What was your book then? Uh, was it? Did the Pittsburgh start to seep into the book at all, or was it still very Ohio heavy? No, no, there was no. There was definitely. I had some nice stuff out of Pittsburgh, and so there was that, and I think I still had a few things from college. Um, I'm trying to think if I had, if they were prints or slides. Oh, man. I don't remember. I so don't remember. Every newspaper brings in photographers that, like, fill a void. I'm going to bring in a, a portrait guy or a guy who's good with sports or a guy who's good with this. What did you think you were at that point the guy to bring in? Mm, I think just general. Okay. I think it was just general stuff. I think they they liked people that were just kind of an all around balanced type of photographer. And what's this? Eighty three? Uh, no, June of eighty four. Just just wow. right like right before more, the Olympics. Like three weeks before the Olympics, I started. Yeah. Right before they blew up. Wow. Okay. So tell me that three day p- process on. I was showing you around. What do they show you in Orange County? What's the... I don't know if they... I'm trying to remember if they showed me anything. I mean, they took me out to lunch. I talked to a lot of people, photographers, photo editors, uh, the editor of the paper. Um, Were they in the Santa Ana building yet? Yeah. Okay. Well, no, not, not the new building. It was the old building. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, it was a real... Like you know, nineteen forties kind of newsroom kind That's of place. Awesome. It? <laughs> yes, still smell the cigarettes. And, yeah, all that kind of. Yeah, grind. exactly. Man, those those are missed. So you know, so yeah, it was it was good. I'm trying to think if they had uh, offered me the. I think they had probably at the end of my stay. They said, hey, you know, if, you know, if you want to, you want this job, it's yours. You know. That's I was like okay. And you. Did you have your mindset before you even left? Like, I'll take this job if they offer it. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Because there was the staff here was already really well known. They were the Register was like one of the only papers in the country that was doing color photos. I think maybe USA Today was the other one. Right. But uh, it was like, man, they were just kicking ass and taking names. Right. Yeah. So it was like, yeah. I want to. I want to get on in on that. How big was the staff back then? Oh man, probably like twenty at least, twenty-two maybe. I don't know. Okay. 
decent so, size. Do you drive out? You ship all your stuff? Oh, and no. Here I comes drove. Mark. Or? I think I'd, I'd put, we put a, uh, like a, a couch and probably, what else do they stick in that? A couple boxes or something with a, with a uh, moving company. Uh-huh. Uh, there must have been a couch and a chair and a, <laughs> something else. The fine and furniture <laughs> at the time. The le- you know, the leftovers <laughs> parents wanted to get rid of kind of thing. <laughs> and no, I drove out in my uh, Ford Escort, you know, my brand new Ford Escort. And I don't know what I had in there packed with everything, clothes and stuff. Yeah. Right. You know, just me, you know, trucking, trucking, trucking. Yeah. Like two and a half days or something like that. Three days. They come out to the register. What's that experience like now? You're in Orange County. Now you're in Southern California. That is, this is not Ohio. It's endless suburbia. And it's, and it's June. So it's summer. Right, right. I was so, you know, it was, you, you could just never get out of town. It's like, it is. It was endless suburbia. I was like, that was just kind of like, wow. Right. There's, it just doesn't end. It keeps going. It just keeps going. Except if you head west, then you have to stop at the water. But, yeah. So the staff's about ready to blow up with the Olympics and take the Pewitzer. Well, yeah, yeah, they had their four photographers that were signed everything, all the, you know, that were all credentialed. And the rest of us were shooting, we were shooting Olympic stuff all the time. Every, you right. know, every member of the community was somehow involved in the, in the Olympics. Right. You know, it was touching. Playing in a band or volunteering or... Yeah. Do you remember? Well, and the, and the, so many events were held here in Orange County, too. Right, yeah. Fullerton had some. Irvine, they were yeah. all spread out everywhere. Yeah, they had wrestling in Anaheim, and I think they had horse jumping out at Coto and cycling down to Mission Viejo. And, and that was a trek back then to get to some of those places. Yeah, oh, yeah. Do you remember your first assignment or first oh. week, what it was like? No, no, no. Were you confident or nervous? I think yeah, I no, I was definitely nervous about shooting chrome. Yeah. What's your what was yeah, your just, what was your process? You just meter and pray oh, or yeah, you kind of right, right? Yeah, meter just, and pray. Yeah. yeah. That was it. I mean, that's yeah. That's what was my process. <laughs> Say hell Mary yeah, and right. <laughs> just Oh yeah, light meter, but yeah, it was setting up lights all the time that you know, coming from a being a documentary photographer to having to Oh, just set up lights inside and out just to fill the shadows and just to get something on film. Right. What lights were you using back then? Norman, 200 Bs. How many of those bad boys did you lug around? I think I had, I had like probably three, three or four and probably th- two or three batteries and they had to have Y cords on them and you've got cords running <laughs> everywhere and... <laughs> I didn't have any slaves or radio. No, no, <laughs> no. none of that stuff existed. You know, Ten you, foot sync cords and, you know. Right. You had to decide where you were going to put your lights and limit it. And you couldn't go here. And you'd, right. want, to, you'd want to put it 40 feet away, but you didn't have a cord long enough. And It, was, it certainly wasn't bright enough. No, you know? no. Yeah, they wouldn't feed. There was not enough light. What was the gear you were using back then? What was the, what was the paper handing out? I think we had all Nikon, Nikon gear. So F3s? Yeah, yeah. Okay. By yeah. then, yeah. 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 Wow. Such a such an unbelievable time to be thrown into that. That talent and that photo staff was just unbelievable. Oh, it really was. It really was. It, and it was great to become friends with all those guys. You know, that was just the coolest. We were all one happy family. And young guys thing. and gals. Like, you were all, I mean, yeah. I mean, it wasn't like there were 60 year old guys. You were all. Young, ready, hungry. Yeah, everybody was under thirty. Yeah, it was, was fantastic. The, what was what was the staff back then? You remember most of them? Oh man, I'll end up forgetting. People. I know that's okay, but uh, I mean, you know, Rick Rickman, right? And Hal Stolesley, Smith, Brian, Brian Smith. Um, I think Lauren Au was there. Um, was Boster there? Or he left. No, Mark Boster had left. Okay, I think he'd left just before I got there. Um, Jeb? Jeb. Jeb Harris was there. JR? Uh, yeah. JR was there. Todd Buchanan. Oh, yeah. Um, Were there any women on staff at that point? 
I think Charlene Brown was there. Okay. And um, maybe Elaine Isaacson. I don't know. Maybe she she might have come a couple years, a few years later. later. Yeah. So at what point now, we'll give you 84, are you feeling, okay, I got my feet underneath me now, knowing Orange County, knowing Chrome, knowing the process of the paper, take a couple of years? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Two or three years. Yeah. Now you feel comfortable. Yeah. yeah. Now you're hitting your stride. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Early. Yeah. Yeah. You're not praying as much. Right. right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Praying a lot less. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. then... So what's that like now in Orange County? Find, where, do you, where do you move? Where do you find yourself? Where, where do you go? Oh, you're still, you're just still, you know, trying to make those nice photos on a daily basis. Um, uh, try, trying to, you know, like a lot, a lot of the sports would happen at night. And so you'd, you know, if you're working a day shift, maybe if somebody was sick or somebody on vacation, you'd try to, work into shooting the angels or work on the weekend and go into a USC game or something like that. Right. Trying to, cause most of, we were all very well rounded and we wanted to stay that way. Cause if you worked a certain shift, maybe you wouldn't shoot any sports, but you know, everybody was dying to shoot sports. And so, yeah, that was the hot thing. Yeah. Or, or, why not? Or, it was a great, it was a great town to shoot sports in. Right. Especially yeah. back then. So, I wanted to back up real quick because I missed this. So there was a a workshop in 77 you took with Sam Ammon. Is it Abel? Sam Abel. Abel. Actually, it was 91. Okay. It was 1991. Did you, not, you didn't take one with him when, when you were a kid younger? Oh, oh, no. I took a class when I was in high school at the, at the Ohio University. I heard that because I had seen his work. And I had heard that he was coming to teach a class for winter quarter. Okay. And so I, I knew the, the people that ran the program there, Chuck Scott and Terry Eiler, because I, I'd known them through Dan Dry. And so I said, hey, I, man, can I, can, I, can I come to this class? Right. Because <laughs> that, that's the thing. It's, it's pre-internet in the 70s, pre-internet in the 80s. Like to find people, find photographers – it was so difficult back then. So how was it taking those workshops with him, you know, and, and you only saw his work if you had National Geographic right. or, or sought it out. Right. How much of an influence was it with photographers like that? Did he really help shape or, or push a direction in your photography? Oh, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I mean, I loved, I mean, he, his work was beautiful. But it was it was subtle. It was it was amazing. Uh, he did a lot of stuff outdoors. He had a couple books. He did a book on the Pacific Crest Trail. Um, yeah, I think that's why I, I just loved his work. And I was like, oh my god, he's going to teach. You know, I want to I want to I want to take that at least sit in on that class. I want to be a part of that. I want to. And you know, he said fine. Everybody said fine. And so you know, I think it was once a, every Thursday for like three hours we had this class that I got and I was with you know juniors and seniors in college and I was a senior in high school I see because I see his influence in your photography mm -hmm. it's there mm -hmm. and that's beautiful it's carried on right I don't right. think people get National Geographic or are exposed to the masters right as much they're more like oh I found somebody on Instagram yeah that's cute but the masters mm -hmm. teach you those are the important people. And it wasn't until I took a workshop in Santa Fe from him in 91 that that a light went off in my photography that that just changed my life. What was that? What did he It was it was looking at your when you when you see your photo looking at at your whole frame all the corners, looking at everything, and that everything in, in that frame you want in that frame. And keep it, you know, as clean and perfect as you can. Right. And which is hard to do. And that's, that's without having to crop. You know, and what you see is what you get, your frame. Don't be cropping into, you know, a 16th of the frame. Right. 
your whole picture is your is your photo. And that's so brave of you to say, because like some people would say, what? You've been at the register for seven years. How did you not already know that? It's like you're still, still always evolving and wanting to get better. You don't want to be the Mark Reitmeyer of 84. You want to be better every day. Right. And for a guy with seven years under his belt at a major newspaper at that time to be like, no, I saw another light and it clicked for me. That's fantastic that you were that open. Yeah, yeah, no, it was, it did. It did, like changed my, immediately changed the way. I don't know if it, if all of a sudden I was seeing his, you know, he would show his work and 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 then a light went off. Went, oh yeah, and also a lot. You know, there were images of his that I know he talks about that he would see a scene and he would sit and wait for the scene to get better or for somebody to walk through into this right. beautiful scene or he'd and if they didn't he'd go back the next day or the next day or the next day mm-hmm. or a week later or a month later keep going back until the light and the scene was the way he wanted it right and, so, and that's what i do i i've told people you know a lot of my photos are are that I'm, I find a scene and then I'm waiting and waiting and waiting, right? For You'll something say, to. Do you say to yourself, "This will look better in the fall, where the light hits"? Right, right. Or in the evening, or yeah, or I'll pass a scene. I go, "Oh man, that's great." I'm going to come back tomorrow morning, or right. It's better at seven a.m. And, and and hopefully, you know, something will happen. A, a person will walk through there. Or somebody carrying a red surfboard to walk through, you know, right. walk through my scene. So, you come back from the paper with this new light on. Does it start to show in your work? Oh, I think so. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah, yeah. I think my my work got better, and I and I, I think it's it's still getting better. You know, it's. I've even looked back a few years, looked at my work, and gone, "Oh man, really? You saved that? What? That's terrible." Right. So I, you know, I think it's it's always evolving. I'm, what was that process then to take what Sam showed you and enlightened you with to back to the paper and go, okay, this is how I'm going to approach a scene, a set, a portrait, a news event. Just now, start to look corner to corner. Yeah, different it, it, lens totally. selection. Totally looking corner to corner and everything. Um. And try to relax a little bit more, not be so uptight about everything. I used to be so, I used to hate to shoot portraits. Why? I, I just, I, 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 it was like, what do you, what do you do? I, you know, what do you do with these people? Right. <laughs> I was so used to being documentary and things happening in front of me. And then all of a sudden just having a person stand in front of me and I'm like, oh, well, what do you do? Dance, <laughs> do, some, monkey. do something for me, <laughs> yeah. you know, please. Dance, monkey, dance. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's a, it's the biggest craft to learn is portrait. You gotta now be this communicator, a psychiatrist. Get them to do something that they might not naturally want to do. They're not professionals in front of a camera, and you're trying to light it or pose them or create this mood. It's a lot to take on. It's it's sure a hell of a lot easier to sit back and <laughs> let it fall into the right. frame. Right. You know, like I said earlier, you know, moving furniture and taking photos off the wall. And, you know, it's like, oh, you know what? And then I learned, like, you don't really have to do that. Just find a nice spot with nice light or, you know, just put an umbrella or, you know, keep it simple. So and did so. you take that on? I'm going to get better at portraits. Yeah, yeah, because so much of what I was do- shooting was so much of we what we did at the register a lot of times was shoot portraits of people. And I said, man, i got to get better at this because <laughs> my portraits suck. That's good for you to say. <laughs> right. Some people just be like, can you just change my hours and I'll, <laughs> right. I'll shoot court stuff or high school football. <laughs> just keep me away from anything that needs a portrait. <laughs> right. So... so I believe in the 90s, the staff at the register was the absolute best it was. With the diversity of staff being between what you guys were able to do. What was it like in that staff in the 90s when you had Yoder and Katata, Goulding's put on the staff, Mindy comes on board. 
uh, Leonard. I mean, you guys were on fire in the nineties. Well, I think that was you know that was like the second second coming of the staff. It was the Rickman and Stolze and Brian Smith and those guys, and then they they all kind of left, and then we got this second coming of this right. group of people that were everybody was great and you know you know uh, we were still one big happy family and then everybody was you know everybody would would uh help each other become better you know right you'd, you'd, you were all competing to make good photos because you wanted your photo to get in the paper but i you know everybody would uh, cheer each other on it was nice in the 90s, did you start to feel the, I guess, gear change, the technological start to change with cameras? You know, you get the F4, the F5 comes in in 96, autofocus, because obviously when you started, you were a manual focus, manual exposure guy. Right, right. So where does that change in the 90s take place? That first kind of revolutionary technological change for you. When did you wow. embrace autofocus? Wow, I'm trying to think when we got autofocus and trust stuff. Because there's a difference. Right. Having it and trusting <laughs> right, it. Right, right. Um, wow, when did we, I don't know when we got autofocus stuff. And, but yeah, there was a time that somewhere in there that, uh, you know, autofocus, auto exposure, auto just auto right. everything. Having anything that said auto, <laughs> <laughs> right? And just let it go, you know, and just worry about shooting good photos. Um, yeah, definitely. I mean, even auto, you know, the flash things, you know, remotes and triggers right. and a slave unit that, you know, would help you out. Right, right. No, no I think that kind of, kind of became easier, so, so to speak, I guess. And you could worry about your backgrounds and... I, I always thought of it, it took sand out of your guys' pocket to make your job easier. Now you're more nimble and lighter to just make pictures right, and not right, have to, right. I don't have to carry this light meter and that cord oh. and all the, I mean. Oh, I was light metering it, you know, how many times do you have a light meter to light meter, turn it this way, turn it that way. Yeah, this light, every light had to be metered at least four times. <laughs> right. Then you had to do the ambient. Then you had to do your, you know, you're like a math student sitting there trying to calculate, okay, what is this? I need to get it to F8. How much light do I need? Right. Yeah, yeah definitely. So, yeah, it, it definitely became easier. And then, you know, I think it was 90, was it 96 that the first we started using digital cameras, which, you know, I think they gave me two of them and they sat in my trunk for... I don't know, eight or nine months. You know, I was I was afraid that, oh crap, they're going to send me out of town, and I'm going to really have to use this. Right. So I, you know, one day I finally sat down and read the manual, and found out there was really no difference than a regular camera. Right. <laughs> Except that you were shooting it very small. It was, I mean, those first digital cameras are just embarrassing when you look back at it. I shot an, a playoff game with with Mark Avery and he had to shoot digital and I shot Chrome. We're at the forum, we're splitting the court in half. And he's shooting a, it's like a 200 millimeter lens that was basically almost a 400. And it was just, he's, he had, it was the one where it showed the whole viewfinder, but then there was this matting that showed you the actual <laughs> picture you were gonna get and you had to try to get it in there. He was, he was a bloody mess by the end of the game. He just kept saying, I keep cropping everybody out. I keep cropping everybody out because he kept visually going corner to corner, but it was not within the mat. How yeah. was that for you? How were those digital, the early digital for you? Well, Did, and it, you know, coming from shooting Chrome to oh. then the early digital, then the early digital, it just kind of, wow. Mm, step back in, step back in quality. It was. This is rough. You know, and I remember shooting, uh, Backstage, I think at the at the Emmy Awards, and I'm shooting all these people, all these award winners coming back, and shoot. We had lights set up and shooting portraits of all these people, and I was shooting the red carpet too, and and yeah, these photos were just really not. Uh, yeah, it's too bad they weren't better. <laughs> <laughs> not not for my part, right. but the, te technical the technical aspect of them. Yeah. How many? And quite a few photographers will cringe when I say this. Were wonderful photos or moments lost because of that early digital to you? 
Did you did you just not make images because the digital failed you? Whether in exposure, ISO, the inability to actually focus. I mean, those early digital was a, just a train wreck at times. Yeah. No. I mean, I know a lot of stuff got got thrown out because we didn't know what do we do with them. Right. It wasn't like you put them in a Manila folder and put them in the file cabinet. Right. You know that here, what, Pam. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's like, wow, wow, what do you what do you do with them? Right. And I think at first we were putting them on. Oh, what were those plastic discs? Uh, zip drives. Zip drives. Yes. Two hundred and fifty yeah. yeah. mega or hundred megabyte uh, zip drives or something. Oh, no, I don't even. It wasn't even Maybe. that big. Whatever they were. Ridiculous. Oh, it was really bad. You know. You could probably put like 20 photos on it or something like that. Uh, yeah, it was, uh, and I think it just a lot of stuff got thrown away. We just didn't know what to do. And that was across the country. Nobody had a good game plan for the post work. Yeah. It was, look, we can make a digital photo, but... but the, now what? <laughs> yeah. And there wasn't an IT department that could say, okay, guys, uh, we need a <laughs> server. What is that? And you guys have to follow this now new protocol. It's not put in an envelope and hand it to Pam. It's called post production work on the back end. Oh, and then we you know, then we got to we got to put them on CDs, right. which was and everybody was using uh, pens that would destroy the CDs. That was great. I always loved that. They didn't tell you had to use a CD or a pen that was proper for a CD and it wouldn't eat the CD away. It was amazing how those early days the destruction. And lost imagery. Yeah, yeah. And there, you know, there's probably you know, from the mid '90s to you know the early 2000s that a lot of images got lost. Right. Or they're great images, but they're you know, five megabytes or something. Right. You know? Think about what those guys shot just September 11th with those digital cameras. What they were shooting with then, and if we took our iPhones out now and made those pictures. I mean, those, those are 1.5 mega file, megabit files. I mean, they were unbelievable. You know, three frames every nine seconds. Right. Just. Yeah, that's right. That was right in the, the beginning of the digital kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. Right there. You're running around. And I don't know how much, I wonder how much, how many of those, I've never really thought about it, how many of those images were really made were made on, if anybody was shooting film, I don't know if people are still shooting film. James was, Nakwe, mm -hmm. but of course he did, right? He's, he comes home and of course it happens in his backyard. Right. But I guess a lot of those guys were running around with bad digital cameras, <laughs> right. that's all they had. <laughs> right. Made it work. And you look back at those images now and go, what ISO were they shooting at? 40,000, it was 200, but it just was god awful. Right, exactly, yeah. exactly. There were three colors. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> So, uh, when did you now, like, just with, like, slide film, took you a couple of years to get your feet underneath you, when did you start to feel like digital and you were working together as a good partner and you weren't fighting it? I don't know, I don't know if I ever fought it. It just seemed, it just, you know, you were always just like, ah, this just isn't like shooting chrome. One of these days it'll get... We hope it'll get better. It's right. got to get better. It's got to get better because it's pretty bad right now. And uh, I, yeah, I think we were, we were all just dreaming. Man, those Chrome days were great. Yeah, you look back at them now and you wish where's the light table? That was some good stuff back then. Where does your love of nature photography? come from because your your imagery is just it's beautiful well i think it's you know it was growing up growing up in michigan you know and, and ohio we would go on a camp family would go on camping trips we oh, every summer you know dad was a college professor so we had most of the summer off we'd go off to new england or pennsylvania or somewhere and go camping and and you know we'd be out in the woods and and it was just, I don't know, that was something magical about being out in the woods and, and, and just to get, you know, having the love of nature. Um, and my dad would take me for 
walks when I was a kid in the woods, like on a, on a Sunday afternoon. And, and I, I just, uh, there's something about nature that I always, I just love being out, out in the outdoors and, and then just seeing, seeing photos, Ansel Adams or, uh, Sam Abel, just seeing these in National Geographic, seeing these grand photos of these beautiful, you know, of these places that somebody would shoot these sunsets or storms or whatever. And, you know, I just really, uh, over the years, have really strived to try to shoot beautiful scenics, which are hard to do, to have the right light, to have uh, the composition, the, you know, the clouds or the mountains or whatever all come together. And then when it all comes together, it's great. It's a great feeling. Just perfect. It's perfect. Yeah. It's a great feeling. Yeah. Did you ever at your time, and let's, let's, just, let's just say it up to 2000, ever think I'm going to leave the register, right? Because we talked about photographers being hot potatoes. You know, so now let's say you've been there 17 years. Is there ever a point where you're like, I think uh, Mr. Reitmeyer is going to pull up stakes and go elsewhere? Yeah, I thought I would after like, I think after I met uh, my wife in 80, well, uh, she, she was at the register and then she left. And then when she came back, I was kind of, that was probably like 89. I was there for like five years. I said, you know, we should, we should really move on. Let's, let's, and she goes, well, I just got back here. <laughs> you know, I just started a job, you know, let me work here a couple of years and then we'll, we'll go somewhere. I'm like, okay. You know, yeah, I was sure. after like five or six years, I was like, yeah, yeah, let's go somewhere else. Yeah. Why not? And it never happened. <laughs> <laughs> Damn her! <laughs> Give her two years that's lasted a lifetime. What is? No, it? it's great. You know, I tell you know, like I, again, you've been blessed. It, it's, really, it's, it's it's such a great. I'm not. I'm not a. Uh, I don't. I'm not a big fan of uh, 80 degrees and sunny every day, but it's a still. It this area is a great place to work. Yeah, you don't have to shovel your driveway. Oh man, <laughs> I made that mistake once. You know, I went back to see my dad at Indiana University. I think we uh, surprised him at Christmas, and it snowed one day like four inches. I said, oh, Dad, I'll go out and shovel your walk and drive for it. And the snow was like, you know, like wet cement. <laughs> and I come in, and I'm just dripping. And I'm like, God, that was a mistake. <laughs> I'll never do that again. <laughs> I'm going home. <laughs> Take your holiday. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. So where... It, with your nature photography, how does that, how did you start to infuse that into your assignments at the register? Because like with your love of the ocean, which I'm going to categorize as your nature, like it so stands out. Like your style is so beautiful to nature and you're a newspaper guy and you, you intertwine them so well. You know, I, I, I think I learned that from Sam Abel because he just did his thing. He goes, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to shoot what I love, and if you want to use it, fine. If you don't, fine. But I think it was embraced. Some of the stuff that I shot was, and it still is, um, embraced by editors of the paper. And they, they, you know, not, it's not all necessarily usable, but a lot, a, a lot of it is. And I think uh, they liked it, and and I love doing it. And so it's like, well, okay. Let's it's do my this. thing, man. I'm going to. Right. Because you would think you've, by looking at it, you'd be thinking like, oh, Mark Reitmeyer must be this tall, blonde surfer dude because you've got this like absolute nature ocean feel to your photography. Like you've grown up in the ocean forever. Like you and the Crystal Cove, do you have like a p actual parking spot down there? <laughs> like, are you, are you in the Ranger on first name basis? <laughs> <laughs> right. No, I, man, I love that. I, I've always, ever since I moved here, I love that. I love that stretch of coast. It's just, it's, 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 it's the, it's not suburbia anymore. It's, it's it's beautiful. Pure it's, Pacific Highway. It's just well, it's just it's nature. It's right. it's out there. You could be a million miles from. You know anything? It's it's yeah, it's wonderful there. Did you? It's a natural, wild California coastline. Right. Did did you do that story when there were? I think it was the '90s, when there was those homes on the beach, 
I think it's like North mm-hmm. Laguna, just the Crystal Cove. Right, that no, was in Chris, Crystal Cove. Right, and they yeah. tore, they'd say, you guys are out. Yeah. Did you do any of that story, or oh, did yeah. you? No, I was there the whole, that weekend, their final weekend, that they were, before they had the, the state kicked them out. I was, I spent the whole weekend there. Now, what was um, the, tell me the backstory. How did they get there? I think it was just this wild coast. I think they've been there since probably like the 19... 19- 20s or 30s and people would just like build a little shack and right because it was nothing and and, yeah no nobody said anything it was so it was just this little community of shacks on the beach and 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 they and and it lasted for decades and finally i think it, it i think it became a state park under i think under reagan when okay. he was governor and, oh, governor. Okay. Yeah. And uh, I think finally the state kind of put their foot down. And now, said, there was yeah, a, I remember a court know. battle for a, a while, back and forth. Mm-hmm. So then, so what's, what was your story on that? Just to uproot your out yeah, of here? Yeah, people, you know, these people that had had these places for decades and their family and just passed down. And, that, you know, that weekend they're like, people are, you know, pushing furniture up and down the beach and moving out and you know it was kind of a it was kind of a sad it was end of an era how did you treat it what, what what's your story you're trying to tell there no like, just that it was this end of an era and and it was such a special place there was no other place around that was like that um you know the rest of the coast has these multi-million dollar homes on it and it's all developed and this was kind of undeveloped it was it was almost like a a campsite, a beautiful campsite with, you know, nicer accommodations. Right. I mean, it was, it, it was a rare gem to even have it there. It's, uh, it was, I just, I never got to go in. I've, I've been to the ones that they've been, they've redone now right, that right. are the historical you could rent, but never the homes. Could you feel like, wow, we are, these people are really getting booted from their home? Yeah. Oh, definitely. Definitely. Yeah, no, I think there were a lot of, a lot of tears, and uh, yeah, the you know, people that, I think there were kids that were now adults that had grown up going down there every summer, and you know for years and years and years, and all of a sudden their summer home was being ripped out from underneath them. We're gonna be right back after a quick break for our sponsor. All right, so there's three stories I want to hear about. One. How fun was it in 2014 for you to go to the Olympics for your first trip? Wow. Yeah, I had always. I think that's something when you're when you're growing up, that you, something that you you know. I think some young photographers, it was you know going to war, going to Vietnam War, or going to Central America or something, and and yeah, there's something about the Olympics that just you always see. You know, they always get a splash in the magazines and the newspapers and. And I always wanted to go to the Olympics. I just thought that would be cool. And here I was, you know, 2014. I'm, man, how old was I? Minus six, uh, like 56 years old or something. Right. You're I'm definitely like, not 24. Man, I think, like, okay, if, if, so I get asked to go go to the Olympics in Russia. I'm like, wow, Russia. <laughs> Oh man, I couldn't have been. You know, <laughs> I wish I'd been somewhere else, yeah. yeah, Vancouver or something. But uh, I was like, well, sure, you know. And I and I loved. I grew up in the winter. I loved the winter. So I'm like, yeah. Little did I know that it really wasn't winter in Russia. Right. It was like going to Palm Springs, right? Or, it's there, yeah, Palm yeah, Springs. It, right. Right. It was, you know, it was it was in the mid, it was in the in the in the fifties and. On the on the Black Sea and right, they're, it, they're it, bringing in snow and, and right. Well, they had it was like here, you know, it was they had mountains nearby, like we have Big Bear, right. and and uh, they had some snow up there. I don't know if they they were making snow. Uh, they had some snow up there, but it wasn't ideal snow. But but yeah, it was it was it was uh, it was interesting. So, what's your pre process? Like, what what are your thought process? What what do I got to pack? What do I got to do? What 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 pictures oh, do I want to make? Well, it was an, you know, I didn't, I didn't have any preconceived what pictures I was going to make. Um, and I try to not to do that with any assignment um, uh, at all. I don't, you know, 
expect the worst and hope for the best kind of thing. Um, you know, I was flying halfway around the world. Uh, I didn't know what I was necessarily getting into. It was, there's a learning curve to shooting the Olympics. I mean, it just, there's this process and that's took me a few days to figure out. Um, you know, I went on, sh you know, shopping spree and getting cold weather gear and special gloves and, and then when I get there and it's really not cold at all <laughs> or I mean I'm inside you know right. I mean I mean you know I'm shooting figure skating you know I don't know if I ever want to see a pair of skates again <laughs> in my life but in hockey you know it seemed like that's all I was doing well you know I was doing local stories the, the you know, figure skaters from Southern California and Solani, hockey, right? hockey players. Yeah, Timu was there for Finland. Right, so the Ducks, um, it's like that, always the a Ducks connection. The Ducks had players there. The Kings had players there. You know, we were shooting those guys and whatever team they were on, the Canadians or whatever. And so, so you're shooting digital. Yeah. Do you, do you sit in your head and go, okay, how many cards do I have? How many hard drives do I have? Is my computer up to date? God forbid anything crashes, dies, and my sup, my you know software is all up to date. Like you get all those ducks lined up yeah, before you even yeah, hit out the door. Yeah, I think I got a new computer a couple months before I went. And got hard drives. Got I don't know two or three extra external hard drives. Got a whole ton of cards. I had like you know fifteen, sixteen cards. But little did I realize they weren't very fast. That's and, oh man, it was a killer. Right. Sometimes when you're shooting, you know, 60 gigs worth of figure skating in one night and, and you then upload download. it. Yeah, download that. And it was just like taking like an hour to do that. And it was like, oh, are you kidding me? Oh. So, yeah, it was pretty painful. I, I, I wasn't, I'm not necessarily a geek uh, as far as computers and stuff are concerned. And yeah, I wish I had gotten super fast cards. So if that's happening to you like in day one, day two, day three, do you change the way you're now going to be shooting or processing, or you start downloading during an event, or yeah, no, you know when there were there was breaks in the figure skating, I was like, man, you can't wait till the end. You can't wait till you know when this is over at midnight. Because you'll never get it. And you know, you know, I I, I was getting home at four in the morning as it was, but uh, yeah, so I'd start. You know, when they'd have breaks, I'm like, okay, I got to get my download my card right now. Start, start. <laughs> so, yeah, get this stuff down. And, you know, just you're shooting skating for four hours and you're, you've are you got a ton of photos to look through. And at first I thought, well, I'm, I'm not going to shoot all these. I'm not going to shoot all these skaters. I'm just going to shoot the three that I, but what if somebody I don't shoot gets the gold medal? Right. You know, Someone like, sneaks up. And, and you're like, oh, man, I got to shoot everybody doing everything. What were those days like? Well, we got there. I flew from uh, L.A. to Frankfurt and spent the night and then flew to Sochi the next day. I got there like nine days before the Olympics. Nine days? Nine days. I went, flew with a writer. Who was the writer? Uh, Scott Reed. Scott. Okay, right. Of course. And <laughs> so here I am. I got to wander the, the Olympic Village by myself for nine days. And you must have been the first photographer there. Right, right, right. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was, well, the whole, the whole being there was probably, for, you know, nine days before, I think it was kind of, uh, I felt like I was always being watched, oh, you know. Yeah, interesting. It, well, we got off the plane and there were like eight military people standing right next to the door videotaping you and, and you're just like, oh, geez, welcome to Russia. <laughs> Hello. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and I think my room was on the top floor in a corner. And I, it seemed like everybody else in my building was just Russian. There was no other photographer, anybody that was remotely, uh, yeah, right. everybody. You had, you had the Warsaw Pact. Nobody was from NATO. <laughs> Man, <laughs> yeah. Were you happy with digital cameras back then in 2014? Oh, yeah, 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 it was fine, yeah. Yeah, I was, I was real happy. Okay. Yeah. Were you guys shooting digital or were you shooting, uh, I'm sorry, Canon or Nikon back Nikon. then? Nikon. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, all so, Nikon. So that made life a little easier. Yeah, yeah. What was your best photo out of there? If someone says, oh, Mark, send me your man. print, your best photo. Because it's very overwhelming. Opening <sighs> ceremonies, closing ceremonies, gold medals, winners, losers. Right. Feature art. Oh. 
I mean, did you even have time for feature art? Yeah, I did. No, I did. I did. In those first nine days, I shot a lot of features. I was shooting features every day. Um, and then I'd try to go before events and shoot stuff in the village. Uh, even going from one venue to the next, I shot, would try to get, you know, I'd have like 10 or 15 minutes and try to shoot a feature or two. Um, wow, my best photo. I, there was a photo I shot of speed skating of a guy that ended up setting a world record in like the 10,000 meters or something. And I wanted, I wanted to pan. And so he would, he would, you know, we'd skate on the inner, on the inner track, then, you know, every lap, then he'd go to the outer track. Then, so I'm, I'm, I'm trying to pan and trying to get a cool shot of this guy. And uh, I mean, you could, you could shoot him tight with a long glass, but uh, I don't know. It was kind of easy. I wanted right. to do something different, so I was panning like it. I don't know. I don't know what I was panning at. You know, fortieth of a second or something. Handheld or on a monopod? No, uh, handheld. Okay. With a wide lens. Okay. Really wide, and and I'm I, and I don't know how many times went by me. You know. Right, over and over. Over and over. And I kept looking at my, you know, my 10 photos every time he'd go by, and I just wasn't getting enough the, the pan correct and getting the whole scene. I mean, I probably shot like 300 images before I finally got it. Okay, got the, got the feel of right, the Right, you've got to get his timing, and you have to swing together. Right, you right. You've got to get the shutter speed right, not too much blur, not, not too little. <laughs> yeah, so it was, ended up being a really nice image. But and he's yeah. fast. Those guys oh, yeah, are those flying. Guys fly, and that, this is this is the uh, the long track, right? I mean, <laughs> ten thousand meters, yeah, yeah. But you know, then I shot shot short track. Now talk about fast. That's right. crazy. That right. that's the the coolest sport ever. Yeah, I love shooting that. Those guys have thighs, <laughs> thighs. It's all they are, just butt and thighs. That's all they do is push yeah. off fast and go. I'm trying to think of another photo that I did. That, you know, there's another one of the uh, Olympic torch at night, and it was just kind of it was at, kind of at dusk, and people were all kind of socially spaced, walking. They were silhouettes walking by it. It was kind of a cool shot. The Olympics lends itself to a lot of panning and all that kind of fun stuff because it's repetitive. You have to shoot 400 athletes doing the same circle over and over and twirling. And so you get there and you do a lot of what you would never normally do yeah, in a Laker do. game. You, do. you would never pan in a Laker game, or SC or something. Now you're at the Olympics and you're like, okay, 300 photos of a guy going by over and over. Yeah, there was one day that I had nothing to do and I, and I think I, I forgot who I was with and we went to shoot short track and all the positions were full and so we just went up to the top of the arena and there were some empty seats and I was like, oh man, okay. And I shot, I shot for like an hour and a half at like a quarter of a second. That's it. And it was, there was like the coolest photos. Right. Don't you <laughs> wish... Sometimes you had that long leash to do that at a football game or any kind of event where you're just like, you know what, I'm going to make a cool photo. Well, I'd see, I'd be, you know, I'd be at like figure skating and I'd be down on the ice and, and I'm shooting and I'd see people and I'm shooting with a, a I don't know, a 70 to 200 or a two to 400 lens. And uh, I mean, the two to four was almost like overkill. I think a lot of times, and I'd see people, people next to me shooting with like a six, a six hundred. I'm like, wow, what? How are you doing that? <laughs> right. and, oh, God, I wish I could, I wish I could do that because he's obviously sees something that's really cool. In a very tight window. Yeah, really tight. But it's like we're, we're yeah. And that we're not, we want, you know, I'm shooting for a publication. We need something. I got to tell a story. I'm not right, shooting product right, photography right, at right. the Olympics with rings <laughs> in the back. I mean, that's, and that's the interesting part. You have so many different people there. Everybody's making a little different something, right? Like David Barnett shows up and you're like, wait, what? A four by five? Really? Speed right, graphic? Right, right. And he makes those images and you're like, oh, I wish I could just spend the Olympics making beautiful photos like that. Instead, I got to follow Katie from Laguna Hills around, and she finishes 17th plates in skating. 
Right, and you know, and, and I'm, I'm, I think I'm the, you know, I'm the old guy when I when I get there, and I and I see all these, you know, who's who in sports photography, and, mm-hmm. and all these other photographers from around the world, and and like everybody was over fifty years old, almost every every photographer. I was like, wow, this is great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, at that point. You know how to make pictures. Right, right. You're not going to send your you know, tw- kid out of college to the Olympics Can and, you imagine and if, keep your fingers crossed he's going to make a good image. Right. You know? Your first assignment for the register in 84 is, oh, by the way, Mark, we're sending you to actually cover the Olympics. <laughs> right. Brian broke his ankle. You're up. Go. Right. What would that have been? Wow. How much praying and crying would there have been? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Right. Exactly. Rick, Rick would have killed you. <laughs> exactly. See, so it's, it's, it's better that you, you had some of that time under your belt to be like, okay, I get it now. I see corner to corner. I understand this, my craft. I'm, I'm, I'm with the masters and I am one. Right. Right. Instead of that lost child weeping in the corner. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so that leads me right into the next story. Because I was there that day, left early, but was the Fullerton Airport incident. We actually talked about it. I was talking to my kids about this. You know, they're, oh, who's going to be on the podcast? I told them, oh, yeah, he's got the great photo. Let's talk that process because there's no way young Mark makes that picture probably, right? Yeah, I don't know. Are you now? Because walk us through it, that process. You're, you've got to be, you've got to be ready yeah no yeah, yeah. well yeah I, don't, luck, I, I can't but believe ready. it wow yeah that was a trip so i get this assignment it's a saturday it's a uh open house at the little little you know fullerton airport mm-hmm. you know every bring your family come and look at the planes you know orange county fire authority helicopters there you know get on the helicopter and kids are climbing on the helicopter and, and I'm shooting photos and I'm just kind of, you know, half of me is my eyes are kind of rolling in the back of my head going, oh man, it's just. Right. This is a community event. People are just staring at small planes parked on the tarmac and okay, well. Did you ever, hold, hold, hold on, did you ever cover the El Toro air show? Yeah. Okay. So right. there's a real Air show, blue right? Angel and there's things. really cool planes right. and stuff. Bombers these are, and yeah, these are Cessnas, Cessnas and stuff. Yeah. Right. So there's yeah. So I thought, no yeah. kid grows up going, boy, I can't wait to fly a Cessna. <laughs> no one ever said. So you know, as we have, we got so many assignments there. You know that community type assignment. You just got to make a good photo at it. And so I spent a I was there for about an hour, and I go to the orange over the Orange County Fire Authority helicopter, and that was, you know, that's, that's a red helicopter and making the images of that. So all of a sudden they tell everybody to clear out that they've got to go, they've got to fly somewhere, that there's, there's actually a fire, and they're going to go, they're going to go. So everybody backs up, gets out of the helicopter, and they get ready, and the, so they fly off, and so I shoot, I shoot that. And I'm going to call the office and let them know there's a fire, that they're running out of uh, fires in the canyon somewhere. And I realized I don't have my cell phone, that I had, it was charging at home. I plugged it in that morning and it was charging. So oh. I don't have my cell phone. So I'm like, well, crap. I guess they'll probably hear about it from <laughs> some, other, some right. other way. So I go on and keep keep shooting and keep shooting and people looking at planes and I'm you know after like two and a half hours I'm I've 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 kind of had enough of this you squeezed every blood out of that turnip oh man so I see this uh I see this plane taxing down toward the end of the runway this is Ford tri-motor which is an interesting it's a replica it's an interesting looking plane and uh and there's his dad with the, his kid on his shoulders standing out on the edge of the tarmac, kind of watch this plane. And I thought, well, you know, I get this kid on the shoulders and this cool plane taken off in the background. And this will be neat. And then I'm going to go. I really need to get. 
So the plane starts to go down the runway, and all of a sudden it veers off the runway and is doing, I don't know, 100 and some miles an hour, whatever it, whatever it's doing. And it's, it's heading right toward me, like, and it's getting closer and closer. And I'm like... Now, are you now the father and son are between you and this plane? Well, no, I was, I've, I've bailed on those guys. Oh, okay. I'm like, I don't, you know, so I go, because I was out on the, as far out as you could go as they let people go. Okay. And there was some, there was a little booth there because they were going to have, uh, give rides on this thing. And, um, and there was like a, there was a couple of vehicles out there and there was a, you know, pop up shade things and, so anyway, this thing's coming right at me, and it keeps coming and coming. And I'm, people, there was about maybe 10, 15 people out that way. And everybody starts running, like run for your life. And it just keeps, it's still on the ground, and it's coming at us 100 miles an hour. And I'm like, and I find, and I'm running too. I'm, you I'm, just not, turn shoot, and I'm go. not shooting any photos anymore. You just turn and go. You're right. And I'm like realizing at some point my mind was like, you're not going to outrun this thing. So I dove behind a pickup truck. And I just like, and so the pickup truck is between me and the plane. And like, I, I don't know what good this pickup truck's going to do, but I, I don't know what my other choices were. <laughs> <laughs> this is it. This is. <laughs> so it, it lifts off probably maybe 100 feet from me. And it flies about 15 feet over my head. And I'm, I could hear it coming, and I've just ran it. I had a wide-angle lens on, and I'm just, like, shooting frames. And it flies, and I have these wild frames of this thing flying 15 feet over my head. And my heart's just pounding, like, holy moly. Right. And so I watch it, and... And I go, it's going to hit the tower. I'm like, wow, what is going on? Is it slow-mo in your head at this point? Like just matrix? Totally. And then it it banks really hard and misses the tower. And I'm I'm kind of watching it, like not believing what I'm seeing now. But even though I did shoot it going over my head, but when I I watched it bank (laughs) at the tower. And and it, it finally is the... Perpendicular, the the wings aren't parallel to the ground anymore. I'm like, it's not going to be flying much further, and so I started. I just started shooting photos, and it did. It just like then crashed in front of the airport, and man, my my heart's still pounding, and I'm like, holy moly, right. this I've plane. survived, but now it's crashed, and so I try to run from my position out on the tarmac to where it's probably two or 300 yards to where the plane crashed. And I was expecting like a big ball of flame or something. And I don't know if it didn't have any gasoline on board or much, but there was very little fire. So anyway, I'm trying to run to get to there. And I literally, my my heart's just going as hard hard as it can. I, I, I couldn't move. I mean, I had to stop because I was like, my body just wasn't working. Right. And uh, and I realized that there were so many fences between me and it that I, w- I wasn't going to get there anyway. So I had to go around and uh, come in, go out the way I came in. And, th- you know, all hell was bl- breaking loose. That plane was sitting out on the, on the roadway smoking and... There was a few people with fire extinguishers out there, and now at this point, people are just just running like crazy out of all over the place. Because there's families, there's people. Right, right. I I don't remember. It's I mean, on there's, Commonwealth. It was, That's a decent sized street. Right. There's apartments. There were people out there standing there. I mean, it, it hit it hit or almost hit an auto part, auto center, auto right. Tire, repair shop, yeah. repair shop. I'm, and it was sitting on its belly out on the middle of that street. It was just surreal. And so I, I went over there and I started shooting as I got near it and I kept shooting and kept shooting. Um, and then as I get closer to the plane, there's like a 
eight, ten foot section, the end of the wing is sitting on the roadway. And there, it's sitting right next to a car. And these women, this, these two women were sitting on the, I think f fire must have, there must have been a fire station or the fire, people were there real soon. These people were helping the, this, this, uh, these two women. And I finally realized that the planes, when the wings were perpendicular to the ground, the wing hit this car driving down the street and broke off. And it was their car because the end of the wing was right next to their car. And they were just like, they were in worse shape than I was. Wow. And I just kept shooting and shooting. And, and then when my heart finally, you know, calmed down, I thought, well, I should probably call the office. But I don't have a phone. <laughs> it's still at home it's charging. Still at home. <laughs> so I asked, I just went up to somebody and said, Hey, I told him who I was. Could I borrow your phone for a minute? <laughs> Straight out of my movie. I need to borrow your phone. <laughs> so I call, I call the office. I call Lauren Al. He's on the photo desk. Saturday. That's Saturday. Hey, Lauren. Uh, there's a plane crash here. And I, I really don't remember shooting any of it. Right. He goes, I go, uh, I, I have some photos. You sound like some young stringer. <laughs> Hi, I got photos of an accident. <laughs> right, right. Okay, kid, come on by. We'll take a look. So, you know, I, I shot all I could, and it was, you know, they'd taken everybody to the who, whoever needed to go to the How hospital. How long did you work the scene? Oh, after it crashed, probably an hour. Okay, because like you're two hour, hours in, and this happens. So. Yeah, an hour and twenty minutes or something. <laughs> and I even went up in the tower and looked, got an overall. I mean, I just shot it from every angle I could. Oh, yeah, I was spot. like, unbelievable. And so I really didn't. So I went back to the office and processed my film, and I kind of gave it to Lauren and said, "Here, take a look." Wait, film? Was it film or digital then? Or was it digital? When was this? 90? Yeah, I think it was digital. I think it was digital. Right. No, sorry, it wasn't. Yeah. So I, I probably uploaded it. Old sorry. Habit, but yeah, yeah, sure. Um, I can said, only imagine okay, here's, you. Right, right. Yeah, I said, here's my, here's my laptop. I got all my images uploaded. I didn't even look at it. I said, here, you look, you look at it. I was still the basket case. I'm from sure. And he's like, you know, oh, wow, Mark. You know, and he shows me the image that ended up running in the paper on the front page. And I was like, I had, I didn't even remember shooting that. Right. I was like, wow. Just, wow. Right. Now, what did you have around your neck? 1735? Yeah. Yeah. And the 70 to 200. Right. That's your pretty standard yeah. go-to community stuff. And yeah. you just pulled, fired, and just did. So you have really no deep recollection of even looking through a viewfinder. It's just kind of happening. Yeah. And I think somebody, I think that was on a Saturday. I think either, I think on maybe Monday, I remember somebody, somebody on the photo desk calling me and said, oh, NBC called and wants you on the Today Show. And I was kind of like, I was, I was still really still rattled, rattled from this thing. I almost got run over by a plane. <laughs> right. And if, now, if I remember correctly, that is a three-prop prop plane, right? Mm -hmm. One right in the nose, right. and two in the center, right. or two off-center. Yeah. So you're yeah. basically looking at Ginsu knives coming right. at you. Exactly. I mean, it's not like, oh, I could you know dodge this jet plane. <laughs> it's, right. it's blades straight front in your face. Yeah. Yeah. Although I couldn't see it because they, the, those pop-up shades... Because it flew, and the, and the truck that I was behind, I was laying next to the wheel. I was on the ground, just, like, praying. Right. You know. Again, back to the praying. <laughs> 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 it, for those who take anything away from this podcast, as a photographer, there's a lot of praying. A lot of praying. <laughs> uh, I so, mean, so, with... Yeah, it took me like a week. I mean, it's still. So you didn't do the Today Show? No. Because no, it would have just, like, no, just no, a no, rambling no, no, fool no, no. otherwise. Right. Thank you. This is Matt Lauer. Like, back to you. And it would have been nothing. No. Me? Yeah. And I've never really been one for. Yeah. 
the yes. spotlight at all. Right. You know, so. There's you've nothing, nothing close to that. Like, just sheer life on the line. And you're not like you're covering the riots in 91 with, like, Paul or anything. But this is, like, fun. Like, the riots you know going in what you're expecting. They're just what you covered in the last couple of months, within a couple of weeks. This is community event. Everything's fun. Everything's jovial. Everything's a good time. And then sheer terror. Right. It turned ugly real fast. Yeah. That's the part that gets your heart rate going. Because you didn't even have a chance to like, oh, okay, I'm covering right, what could right. be Gear a protest. body up for right, something. A protest yeah. could turn ugly. Right, right. Nobody says <laughs> <laughs> community events turn ugly. <laughs> that's, the, that's the horror. That's the Stephen King novel. That's how, how it's all fun and games. How, until, how can this, you know, airport open house, how can it go bad? Right. <laughs> I'll show you. <laughs> Kinsu knives. <laughs> yeah. And, if you look back at it now, I mean, there's nothing you could say I could do different because you're basically just running on pure survival instinct. Just find something to get between me and blades. Yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah you didn't... What direction are you going to run? You don't know which direction right. the plane's going to go. Right. You know? It's already darted one direction. <laughs> right, right. It could go a little bit and nothing, you know. Right. Yeah. So then let's talk about something a lot more fun, the Then and Now Project. I always loved that with the older photos and then you presenting the now photos in that. How did that come about? Oh, yeah. I shot... <laughs> Maybe I'd seen that somewhere, and uh, like I, old Huntington Beach with the right, you know oil rigs. Right. Now it's Huntington I Beach with I, the homes. I think I, I had been years ago. Been to I think if the, it's First American Title Company or I'm not sure that their name. They have like the biggest archive of old photos from early Orange County and uh, a couple times I'd have to go there and copy old photos of old buildings or old something and I would end up seeing these scenes of Orange County back you know when PCH was just like a a dirt trail running right. along the coast and I'd, and there were some they have some wonderful photos and I again, I think I had seen somewhere where somebody had done that that type of thing and had a had a an old photo in you know today's scene, mm -hmm. and that, that that was just something that was really really cool that I I thought that I, I would try to do, except I hate the look of my hands <laughs> when I'm holding that photo out in front of my camera, and and then it's weird if you have somebody else do it for you because the, you're, it's you're never right for, yeah. you, you're, you're holding your camera with one hand and grabbing their hand with the other and <laughs> moving it back and you know and it's just like goes, it doesn't work. No, yeah. it's got to be you. Yeah, it's got to be me. <laughs> <laughs> That's what makes it the best, though. I should go it's to the you. nail salon <laughs> beforehand, though. <laughs> Do you believe you were born in the right era? Do you would you be like I want to be a photographer in the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, or do you like the era you're born in, where you've got that film to digital, or would you want to be the 20 year old Mark now coming up? No, man. Yeah, I, oh, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't want to be coming up now. I don't. Maybe it's fine, but <laughs> right. No, but would you, know, you like? No, to it was a great. It was like the heyday of you know. Photography and, and publications. Thirty five was, was now the the medium. There wasn't the oh I'm shooting thirty five that transferred over to you know medium format and thirty. It was thirty five. Right. There was right. no going back to speed graphic. Right. Right. Can you imagine going to shooting sports with a speed graphic? Remember Stan Bird? He's a community. I would talk to him and he and he would say that how he used to cover with a speed graphic and then with a, a Raleigh and just be like how. Wow, one photo of frame, shoot it, pull it out, start over, put in a new bulb. Just be like, oh, good God. Well, that's my, my, my when I first got my Nicromat and I'd go shoot sports, it was click, you know. Advance. Advance the film, click, yeah. 
Right. That's how it was. That's how that's how it was. <laughs> Take you know? it. Yeah. So no, I think it was a great it's a great time to be it was a great time to be uh, a photojournalist in the time that I've I've been in. That that yeah. era you've yeah. risen through. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. Big time. How okay, so we talked about your building your confidence into becoming a portrait photographer, right? There was no, there was a learning curve. How are you now? How do you like to deal with celebrities now? Because, or just the I general, don't. the general public now. <laughs> right, right. No, I don't, we don't, we don't shoot as many celebrities and shoot those portraits anymore. Um, no, I'm, I'm actually really comfortable dealing with pe- you know dealing with people in general and shooting portraits i mean what i've got, got a there? lot of i know it's just uh repetitiveness uh, yeah, rep- yeah repetitiveness and getting uh realized that you don't have to stress over it and you you know there there's beauty everywhere and and there's there's always a scene that you can take somebody a doorway or a, a simple scene where you could place somebody in it and and you don't have to uh, you know stress over it really Right, and you you have found that beauty in everything mm-hmm. in the wedge. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about that. I know when the surf gets up. Oh, okay, Mister Mister Mark's going to make some pictures. I mean, you love that beach, that wedge. There was a time I knew the surf was big, and I thought I was going to get a jump on it, and pfft, you were already there. Yeah, no, that's you know that comes with working uh, early shift too, working at six a.m. in the morning. You know, it's. Yeah, if the surf's going off, yeah, you're down there six fifteen in the morning, and You've just some, with the surfers, and yeah, uh, it's great. You know, nice some, light and big waves, and you got any tips for shooting those monster waves? I mean, you you nail so many unbelievable wave photos for people that live in Orange County. Like you crush it. I know. I, I guess it's just the experience. I've done it. You know, I said I told. Somebody recently, when I was I was actually back at Ohio University back in uh, January, and I said to somebody, I said, "Who would have thought that this kid from Ohio would spend 35 years shooting surfing?" But you know, I think you know, the more you do something like that, the better you get at it and understand it, and understand the waves and uh, and the surfers. No, it's fun. I you know I love it. It's, you know, it's something I didn't really grow up with, and it's. I still love shooting it. I mean, you couldn't tell. For the love of God, it looked like you've been a water polo right, player and you've right. been in the ocean forever. <laughs> I mean, because whether it's big, huge south-facing swells at the wedge and you nail it, you're, you're never over. What I always found incredible is you were never over or under-lensed. You always had the sweet spot. I, some guys go, I'm taking the six. Well, not at the wedge. Right, right. No, you want to show the whole, the, it, you know, it's part of my, maybe my nature. I'm, I'm almost bring my, my nature photography, my scenic kind of photography into that type of scene where I want it, I want it to be a beautiful photo. I'm not just, I don't want just another action shot of somebody right. riding a wave. I'm, I, I want this to be a beautiful photo. And and they can be, but you need to show like the whole wave, kind of the whole scene, and then put the the surfer or the body board, the you know the body border or the uh, body surfer in that scene. So the the wave creates the scene, and then you, hopefully somebody's in there. You got falling it. thirty <laughs> feet. You know. Hey. Have you ever shot that and gone, oh boy, this is going to go ugly for somebody? Because falling 30 feet. Or onto, whatever, 20 feet right. or something. But, oh, yeah. But and yeah, then you're, having, you're you know, how fall, many tons of water falling on top of you? Yeah, you know? even falling six feet, you're only falling <laughs> on 12 inches of water. But right. that's the thing people don't understand. You're not falling out into the Pacific. There's no water right. underneath you. So I don't care right. what the fall is. You hit sand, and then a foam falls on you. Right. <laughs> it's like Butch, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance yeah. Kid when they jump off that cliff. Yeah. yeah. I mean, so have you ever shot any of those and just gone, oh, this is not going to oh, go yeah. well? Oh, yeah. You see somebody. Really like, hammered. Oh, man. This is not gonna. This might be a rescue in the making here. <laughs> I just shot Spot News. <laughs> right. 
Yeah, fortunately, I've never been there when they've, you know, somebody's gotten messed up because I know people have gotten messed up real bad oh, yeah. down at the wedge. Oh, God. Like broken their back or their neck or something. Yeah, yeah I saw a wrist one time and it was pretty ugly. Oh, man. Yeah. I've just seen broken boards down there, but that's about it. I don't know who would ever want to put a surfboard on that monster. Some people do. Yeah, you know, it's crazy. And I know just a few days ago, they, it was crazy. I didn't get to go down there. I was doing other stuff, but yeah. Hmm. Okay, so what is still driving you creatively? What is still getting your fire lit to keep pushing Mark every day? That's the challenge. I know. You would think by now that I would just, like, I've you know, been there, done that, and... Has mirrorless helped? Because I know you got a little love for Sony. Yeah. I've seen you uh, play with that weapon. Yeah, I know I play with that. Um, hmm, no, it's just, it, you know, it's like, it doesn't matter what kind of camera you're using. You know, whether it's your, your, it's I, a your, tool, iPhone, though. your iPhone or your... Yeah, right. yeah. Um, I don't know, it's just... To me, it's 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 just every day to see what uh, what kind of photo is gonna. You never know. Every day is different, and and like out of these just simple community assignments, there are good photos there. And I mean, there's good photos in your backyard. You know, I shot a photo of a squirrel climbing uh, climbing up wires last <laughs> night. That was just kind of funny, you know. Um, you just never know what you're going to find out there. I think that's what's fun is just being out there and still the spontaneous of the, the job. Spo yeah, just spontaneous that you're going to see something that's going to be really cool. You know, I shot a picture of a, a dog out for a walk the other day at San Clemente who was wearing a a hot dog outfit, and it was just hilarious. <laughs> Of course. It was just, it was totally hilarious. So, yeah. Now, is that a difference you would see between Ohio and California? You would probably never see that in Ohio, someone with a hot dog dog? Yeah, that no. That sounds no, very California. Think, right. There's so much, you know, and people, some people comment on photos of mine on Instagram or Facebook or something that, you know, only in California, you know. Right. And you're no, like, yep. There, yep. There's, there is just, yeah. Yeah. We're not, it's not as conservative here. And do you, they're just fun things that happen right. all the time. Do you follow anybody? Do you still keep up with some people to push your creative envelope or, or get you going? Or is it just your inner fire? No, I think it's more my inner fire. I don't, I don't. That's follow, fantastic that you I have don't that. Follow, I don't follow any, I mean, I look at other people's work, but I don't, I, I don't. I don't look at people, others' people work and say, oh, I, I, I want to be like them or anything. I want to try just, that or do that. Or, yeah, no. It's more about own, a boy. I'm just kind of my own. I'm, just, I'm happy just being who I am, I think. <laughs> that is a sign of a classic man. <laughs> Mark, I can't thank you enough for your time. Sure. It was awesome to sit down with you. We've worked together for a very long time, and I think this is the longest we've ever talked with <laughs> microphones in front of us. <laughs> exactly, exactly. I, we covered, okay, so I, this is my greatest, fondest moment with you. We covered a Rose Bowl together. Do you remember that? Like in the early Maybe. 2000s, it was Wisconsin and wow. somebody. Yeah. So it was like you and I, uh, Goulding, and I want to say either Dan or Bruce, and Nick and Kenny were labbing for us. So it was film. Huh. We were film. And I remember... You know, Nick would do that walk around, pick up film. Right. And so it was halftime. And Nick had on the wall, like, how many pieces of film he had picked up. And I had, like, more than, I think, all of you guys twice. And you're just <laughs> going, boy, young kid, you're just really taking pictures today. And it's just kind of like, oh, God, I'm doing my best to stay with you guys. <laughs> No, that was fun. You know, you know, all those, all the, you know, all the events. It's so neat being at the different events, the big events in in, in this type of uh, in LA, and all the people that you get to meet and you get to work with and see. And, and uh, you know, if you were still in Ohio or somewhere, you know, there'd be you know one or two of you, and that's it, small group. You know, but you come to you come to you go to the Rose Bowl, and you're like, wow. Yeah. 
two hundred people. All of a yeah, sudden. your right, friends again. Hey, right, there's Lewis, right. there's Wally, there's Rick, there's this guy. There's right, a... right, right. Yeah. No, it's great fun. Well, Mark, thank you so much. I appreciate Thanks, your man. time. It's great talking to you. All right, let's go to lunch. All right. Yeah. Bye. Hope you enjoyed that podcast. 